Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Deeper Dive Bible Study here at the Mount Zion Church in Nashville, Tennessee. I am Bishop Joseph Juan Walker III, and of course, I'm grateful to have you connected every single week. Those of you that watch this Bible study, thank you so much. Deeper Dive is for serious people who really want to go deeper in God's Word, and we in Mount Zion take the Word of God so seriously because we are a Word-centered ministry. I'd love to connect with you wherever you're watching me around the world. Follow me at Joseph Walker 3. Follow my wife at Dr. Steph Walker. And then, of course, follow Mount Zion Church at MT Zion Nashville. Uh, we appreciate you so much. And on this YouTube channel, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And if you want to do interactive notes where you can actually take the notes and actually email them to yourself, download the free Mount Zion Nashville app, and I promise you, you can do that. Now, guys, we are getting closer and closer to becoming a couple of destiny. National Marriage Conference, March the 30th through April 2nd, downtown Hilton, Nashville, Tennessee. And registration is still open. Spots are going quickly. Get these last few spots, y'all, because you know that rush is happening. I want you to be there. It's going to be powerful. Everybody, you know, invest in entertainment. Nobody invest in empowerment. We want you to invest in this, man, for your marriage to grow, to be in a place where you say, I care about the future of my relationship, whether you're single, married, doesn't matter, you can be a part of this amazing conference. Now, let me tell you, so excited. She heard me talk about on Sunday. Oh my God, All Tide Sunday. Easter Sunday, April the 9th, last year, we went over the wall. This year, we're calling for 100% tithers. We want to raise, again, over a million dollars. But our efforts this year are gonna be so focused and unique as we are focused in on HBCUs. So much has been said about people not supporting historically black colleges and universities. And we're going to make sure that we as a faith community step up, that other churches around the world will see us do it and will also do the same thing. We're going to focus on that also our high school scholarships, and then our outreach. We want to do something in building out our outreach center and our NAF location and focusing in on doing more outreach in our community. So thank you in advance. We're going to do it. And you know what? I just got a feeling. We're probably going to exceed what we did last year, and we can't do it without you. So we're trusting God. And uh, we were able to build that teen center debt-free in excellence, and I just believe that as we do all time Sunday this year, y'all know how we do it at Mount Zion. We go higher and higher every single year. So to that, we want to open up now for offering and tithe and giving, and I want to give you an opportunity now to be generous before the Lord. Let me pray over you, but I want you right now here, I want to make sure you text to give, do what you have to do, here are the prompts in which you can do that every single week. Thank you in advance for supporting this ministry. And as you're seeing what God is doing, make sure you sow into it. To God be the glory. So Father, thank you for the privilege we have to sow and to give. I pray for families now that you will bless them. And I give you glory and praise. It's already done in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going back into spiritual warfare, guys. And we're going to hit part two today. I'm going to talk about your authority and your anointing. <laughs> Woo! Your authority and your anointing. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents, on scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subjected to you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What is spiritual authority? We talked about this. We talked about warfare last week. I want to talk about spiritual authority, though, because as I've shared this many years, I want to share it again. Spiritual authority, people of God, is not brute force power. It's not that. It's delegated power, much like a policeman possesses. You know when a policeman pulls you over or something happens, you respect that police officer because of the delegated authority that that police officer's badge possesses. So it's important to know that when you deal 
with authority that's delegated. A police officer not only has a badge, but they have a weapon to back it up. So that's what's important. You know that that authority is backed up by a law. You as a child of God have authority in Christ. Say that with me. I have authority in Christ. And you're not stopping the forces of darkness, sickness, and fear and evil with your own strength. You're doing that because you are backed up by the power of Christ. All the power of God is backing you up. And when Jesus rose, he says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He gave that power to you. That's the authority that you've been sent with. And how amazing is that, that God's power is behind your authority. Ephesians 6 and 10, brethren, be strong in the Lord. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I like that because the strength is not mine. Sometimes we, we like to floss. We like to flex in the spirit realm and make people think it's us. But no, man, it is, it is God's authority. See, spiritual authority, though, belongs to us. But it, belong, but, it, but it originates from God. The Bible says that you are the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Jesus, we know, is the head. We are the body, which is the church. And his authority is perpetuated through the body. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he transferred his authority on earth to his body. The church, you and me. So in God's mind, when, the church, when Christ was raised, we were raised. We, through that relationship, also got up with power. Everybody talks about, you know, it's beginning here at Easter. He died. He died. And early Sunday morning, what did he get up with? He got up with power. And who has that power? You do. I do. And Paul was saying I'm, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Ephesians 2 and 6 and he raised us up together. Look at it. He raised us up together. Ephesians 2 and 6. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Both the head and the body are seated there next to God in a place of power and authority. That means that you are seated there. You are seated in the power position. You are his heir. Romans 8 and 17 says, And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Whew! That means that everything that, everything that is in him including his authority, now belongs to you. So the question is, then how do I use that authority? How do I use my spiritual authority? I'm glad you asked. The door of exercising your authority in Christ hinges on Ephesians 1 and 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Ephesians 2 and 6, he raised us up together made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you to meditate on those until you fully grasp the revelation that you are seated with God and that you are the one God moves through. Say that with me. I am seated with God and God works through me. See, when the adversary arises, and he will, use your authority to speak out what God's word said, using the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. you. Get it? See, you could say, sickness, I command you to leave my body in the name of Jesus. According to 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes, whoo, I'm already healed. The authority, man, this is important. The Bible says, he himself bore our sins. Look at it. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died. 
We died to it, to sin. We already know Jesus paid the price. In other words, he already paid the price for that. So the authority is we're operating on authority that was purchased at Calvary. So when I use his name, it's because his name carries authority. It's like using the name of the president or a company. The name can get things done. It's the same in the spirit realm, except that the name of Jesus is higher, carries more weight than any other name. <laughs> Philippians 2 and 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. See, Jesus made it very clear that his name is the key to all authority. In John 14, 13 and 14, and whatever you ask in my name, in my name, that I'll do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Because if you ask anything in my name, he says, I will do it. You remember when Peter and John were fresh from a Pentecostal experience in Acts chapter 2. They go get to Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are walking and they come by this gate called Beautiful. They see a lame man and they say to him in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the Bible said, and he did. It wasn't their own anointing or their own power that raised that man up. It was the authority in the name of Jesus. Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have in the name of Jesus. See, that same authority belongs to you. I need you to square your shoulders and walk in that level of authority because the name, man, using his name is so important in getting things done. Acts 3, let's look at it. Let's really go a little deeper here. Verse 1 says, And Peter and John went together to the temple of the hour of prayer. The ninth hour, a certain man was lame from his mother's womb. He was carried there, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. He was asking alms or money from those who entered the temple. And he saw Peter and John going into the temple. He asked for alms, fixing his eyes on him with John. Peter said, Look at us, look at us. I want you to understand this. He said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold. There it is. Do I have not. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name, not my name, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Hallelujah. And he took him by the right hand lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping, stood, walked, entered the temple with them, leaping and praising God, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. I wish you could get this. And they knew that it was he who said begging. Watch how this happened. They knew that was the same person who was asking alms at the gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. That's the authority. When you have authority, you walk in that authority and you declare that authority over a situation, you're saying, when I show up, things get better. I have the authority in me that when I show up, everything the enemy is tied up is about to be loosed. Everything the enemy has attempted to bring in despair is about to be delivered. That's the authority I walk in audacious authority, unapologetic. So the question is, how do you tap into that authority in spiritual warfare? Well, it's about renewing your mind. Because remember, I'll say it over and over again like a broken record. Your mind is the battlefield. The outcomes of those battles are determined, determines the course of your life. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know it. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And don't you be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. 
Whew. So old ideas, opinions, worldviews have to be replaced. And you've got to allow God's truth to continually wash away all the world's filth, lies, confusion from your mind and adapt to God's perspective. But you also have to learn the power of rejecting doubt that arises from the circumstances. Because we are century creatures as human beings, and we cannot fathom with our own five senses. We often tend to disregard, watch this, what is happening in our century space. There are things that are happening every single day. If we allowed ourselves Understand how God uses this. God, watch this, does not really want to just move us to a place of casual relationship with him and love. He wants to overwhelm us with this love that we know without a doubt in our mind that we are loved by him and we are protected by him and we have authority and anointing in him. So it really is possible. It's, it's really Impossible to have faith and doubt at the same time. You really can't just like believe, like God, I believe you, but then I doubt. I have a plan B or I'm second guessing you. See, God rewards faith. The Bible talks about this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So the helmet of salvation we talked about last week is firmly placed on our head. We can believe what seems to be impossible. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for those who come to God must believe that he is, watch the reward, and that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him, constantly after him. 1 Peter 1, 89 says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believe, and you rejoice for joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah. I want you to learn how to keep an eternal perspective, how to look beyond your current situation and see life from that eternal perspective. Because when life crashes around you, you got to remember how to look up. Look at me. Look up. Because your salvation is the most precious gift that you've received. And keeping your eyes on that can help you weather all of life's storms. God didn't save you to see you go under. So we can choose to live our lives under this motto. If it doesn't have eternal significance, it's not important to me. Matthew 6 and 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. I love that text. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 13, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, right? Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Man, let me talk to you for a second. Can you just remember that victory is already accomplished? Look at me. Victory is already accomplished. When you consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God, Romans 6, 11, likewise, you also Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive in God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's important that you eliminate many of the opportunities Satan uses to entrap you. When choosing to sin no longer, you set yourself up to be a new creature. You set yourself up for God's best. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation and old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. First John 3 and 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for he's, his seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he has been born of God. See, when we effectively cut off many of the avenues of failure, we make room to 
exercise the authority that God has given us. When you get all the negativity out of your life, all the shortcomings, all the stuff that's tripping you up, that so easily besets you, you begin to realize how incredibly anointed you really are. See, you are anointed for the task. The word anoint comes from the Hebrew word Masah, which means to pour out. It would pour out oil on the head. And the Bible, anointing is often used to describe the process of consecrating someone or something for a specific purpose, to set them aside, to anoint them for the task. But it also can refer to the power and the presence of God that is given to someone in order to enable them to fulfill their calling. Do you know you are anointed? Say that with me. I am anointed. And one of the most important things you got to remember about the anointing is that it is not about us. It's about God. He anoints you that people might see him and not you. So when we are anointed, it's a sign that God is using us to accomplish his will. Hallelujah. Anointing is a sign of approval, blessing. When you are anointed, you don't have to try to flaunt it. People know you're anointed. The devil in hell knows you're anointed. So understand this, man. When I'm anointed, I walk in the room with a certain level of authority and positioning because of the anointing on my life. I'm not like everybody else. I am anointed. So you don't have to like me. You don't have to speak to me. But you can't deny I'm anointed. And you know the anointing is not these things. The anointing is all missed. Anointing is only physical, people think. Anointing is not just physical, y'all. It's spiritual. When someone's anointed, they receive power and authority from God. It's a spiritual thing. See, some people think, well, anointing is just for pastors and prophets only. No! You can be anointed as well. You're anointed every day you go to your job. You're anointed for that. God anoints us for different tasks in the body of Christ. So it's not just for pastors. It's not just for someone in a position in church. It's about people every day who have to walk in a level of anointing and authority to declare, Satan, you will not have my life. So if anyone who is called to do God's work and is obedient to him, then you can be anointed. And when you are anointed, you walk in that anointing unapologetically because you understand something. Nothing's going to rob me of God's plans for my life. Yeah. Nothing's going to rob me of that. When I'm anointed, I, I care that. When I walk in, demons know I'm anointed. So that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I really want you to understand the anointing on your life. Because some people are operating out here in spiritual warfare and don't realize the authority and anointing you have. That's why when you walk in the rooms, people scatter. People talk about you silently because they can sense the anointing and the authority on your life when you walk in. Let me close like this. The anointing breaks the yoke. What do you mean? I want you to think about a mule being controlled by this yoke on his neck. Go this way. Go this way. But the Bible says of the anointing, whoo, in Isaiah 10 and 27, the anointing breaks the yoke. All of us have yokes, things that direct us, pull us, our emotions and things that's pulling us in ways that's inconsistent with what God would have us to be. You look at that same verse in the King James Version, it actually says that the anointing destroys the yoke. Whew, and this shall come to pass, Isaiah 10, 27. In that day that his burden shall be taken away from thy shoulders, his yoke from thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So how can we break the yoke? By feeding our spirit and not our flesh. That's why it's so important to be authentic in what we do for God. Because when you have a sense of authenticity, you draw unto yourself that which is anointed and that which has authority. Ladies and gentlemen, it means you know God's will and purpose for your life. Now you can walk obediently in God's will with the authority you need to destroy everything the enemy throws at your life. So let's continue to be anointed and authentic in that anointing. It's one thing I'll tell you. I know I'm anointed to do exactly what I'm doing right now, sharing this word with you. <clears throat> And I pray that the anointing on your life will help you go to another level 
of authority in your life and not walk around, tucking your tail, running away like a wuss. You have authority. Say it one more time. I have authority. I am anointed. I thank God for you today. And I hope this Bible study, Deeper Dive, has been a blessing to you. Man, I love this series. And I've got one more to share with you next week from this series. It's going to bless you. But I'm so incredibly thankful. And I want to give you an opportunity. If you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be a part of this ministry. Renew your relationship. Text the word salvation to 78228. And our team will follow up with you no matter where you are in the world. Thank you so much. We give God all the glory. And until next time, I'll see you right here on Deeper Dive.